Welcome to Belmont School Committee Candidates Debate, Town Election 2024. I'm Anne Marie Mahoney, and I'm your host for this debate. I'm very excited to have the three candidates for school committee with me. We're going to have some interesting questions, and I guarantee we're going to have some interesting responses. Very quickly, here's our format for our, our debate today. Uh, each candidate will have an opportunity, one minute, to give an opening statement. Then we will ask questions. Each candidate will have an opportunity to answer the question for up to two minutes. After all three have answered, if a candidate wishes to either rebut or add something, that person will have up to one minute to do so. And then each candidate will have one minute for a closing statement. We're going to begin with the opening statements. Interesting fact, using either first or last names, the alphabetical order is the same. So welcome Angus Abercrombie, Matt Kraft, and Meg Moriarty. Angus, we're going to start off with you. Go for your opening statement. Thank you, Anne, and thank you to the Belmont Media Center for hosting this debate tonight. Also, thank you to those at home watching. This is a really important election as we ensure we have the resources and leadership to tackle a rapidly changing landscape. Now, I'm running for school committee to bring back the key perspective that we get from having someone who's been in a modern classroom facing the same challenges that the school committee is discussing today and to push back on Belmont's culture of kicking the can down the road on key issues to make sure that good ideas that we already have are actually making it into district policy. I'm a lifelong Belmont resident and a graduate of Belmont's public schools, and I know this what this town is capable of. I'm asking for your support to secure the excellent and sustainable schools that Belmont deserves. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Angus. Matt, your turn. Hello, my name is Matt Kraft, and I'm committed to making Belmont schools a leading example of educational excellence. I'm a dad to two young kids, a volunteer soccer coach, a professor of education and economics, and a former high school teacher. I first volunteered as a tutor in college and have dedicated my career ever since to strengthening public education. Now I'm running for school committee to build trust and transparency and to put my 20 plus years of experience to work for the town that I love and the schools where my kids attend. People ask me, Matt, you're an education economist. What does that mean? It means that I spend my time partnering with districts to study the most effective and cost efficient ways to strengthen public schools. I ask for your vote on April 2nd. Thank you, Matt. Meg, your turn. Thank you. I'm Meg Moriarty, and I'm running for re-election to the Belmont School Committee. So it's my understanding that this debate is to help you answer the question who to vote for for school committee on April 2nd. So in keeping with education practice, I'm going to provide you with a rubric by which you can decide how to choose the right school committee members for the future of Belmont, informed by a letter written in 2021 to the editor by Ruby Luciano. One, you need a school committee member with experience governing on a board who knows how policies work, which is not easy to quickly wrap your head around. You need a school committee member who knows how budgets work. We oversee the majority of the town's budget and must represent all, budget tax, uh, all Belmont taxpayers. Three, you need school committee members who have skills in negotiations. We must look out for our students' best interests at the table when we sit in the room with the teachers' union. And four, you need school committee members who know what levers to push in order to advance our students' best interests. So over the next hour, I will demonstrate to you that I meet these criteria. Thank you very much. Thank you, all three of you. Let's get right into the questions. Matt, you're going to have the opportunity to answer first. I'd like to know what your position is on the override. But first, I want to say the school's share of the revenue pie has grown exponentially in the past 20 years. Should the school department be looking for ways to save money rather than asking for more? I'm glad we're starting here because there's no doubt that this election is incredibly important for the future of our town and the future of our schools. I'm a strong supporter of the override. I think that we as a community have an opportunity to invest in the services 
that all residents benefit from, and that without that investment, we stand to lose major opportunities to move our schools and our municipal services forward. I also recognize that this is a substantial ask. There are many residents who live on fixed incomes, and it will be a hardship to increase their tax base. And so I'm committed to guaranteeing that when we do invest, we use our dollars to the fullest extent possible, and that we at the same time continuously look for efficiencies and are transparent about how we are using those resources so we can build trust and make sure that that information is easily accessible. If we do not pass the override in this upcoming fiscal year, the schools are facing a $2.7 million shortfall, and in the following year, another $1.7 million. It also doesn't make financial sense to not invest when, if we can, with new investments, actually gain money by bringing students back to the district who are currently in out-of-district placements for special education, so we don't have to pay for the transportation costs on top of those additional tuitions and serve those students better, and we don't have to pay for the unemployment benefits for layoffs. We have to be able to support our students and I agree, we should always be looking for ways to save and to potentially cut. That is the job, and I'm here to serve whether an override passes or not. But I think we have to be realistic about the, the challenges we will face without that support. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, Meg, your turn. Sure, so um, yes, I am in favor of an override. Um, when I think back to when I went to school, and I think for many of our students these days, um, students come to school for many different reasons, and one of the things that motivates them to come to school is often things like performing arts and music and, um, and, uh, and athletics. And uh, I've said before about this override that um, the override is a, really about maintaining the status quo in our schools right now. So um, if the override passes, we are able to retain all of those opportunities for our students um, and make some improvements to really what are the basics of learning. So reading, writing, and arithmetic is what we all think of when we think of the basics of education. Um, and those are some areas that we would be able to invest in um, that are really critical for our students right now. So I um, am in favor of that. And like I said, I, I feel like this override really allows the schools to, to maintain what they've been doing, um, as well as make some investments in really uh, what we would refer to as um, basic academic uh, needs. So. You know, there was another part to the question too, which has to do with the the part of the pie, the right? Pie, right. Um, and that is that is challenging, I think, for everybody to um, think about until you start to think about the way that the schools have grown. So even since the 1980s, our schools have grown in enrollment by about 40 percent, whereas the town's growth is closer to around 10 percent. Um, also, the needs of our students have changed. Our population of our EL students and our special education students, as well as our students with high needs, um, as I've stated in meetings before, has grown tremendously. So I do think there are some reasons why that pie has shifted. Uh, I also am completely committed to looking for um, areas where we can begin to consolidate um, and save, and um, I can talk a little bit more about that later in terms of ways that we've already started to do that. All right, excellent, thank you very much. Angus, how about your thoughts? The top line on the override is not an area where you're going to find disagreement at this table. Uh, we all support it, and I'm proud to support it. Every single thing that my campaign is doing has vote for the override written all over it, uh, because it is the most important issue on our ballot this year. We have to place that in the context of the broader town. We have not done the work necessary to produce adequate revenue in Belmont over the long term, and we can't fix that this year, so an override is where we go to deal with a budget deficit. Uh, but there's a lot of good work happening on the revenue side and on the consolidation and cost-cutting side within the schools and outside of the schools. Uh, and I'm proud to have been involved in some of that work as a town meeting member, uh, getting reforms through town meeting relating to our assessment procedures that is going to allow us to support more commercial growth and payment in lieu of taxes. and in essence, reduce the residential tax burden. Uh, 
But we also need to recognize that Belmont does not get a whole lot of funding as school districts go per pupil. We're not in the top uh, against other school districts in the state. We're actually around the bottom 20th percentile. And what that means is that we're already doing quite a lot to help the town find those cost reductions. Uh, we're going to keep doing that work. We're going to look at ideas that already exist, like uh, merging IT departments or selling ad space on school grounds. These are ideas that have existed for a while, and we haven't acted on them yet. Uh, but that's what I want to do. I want to come in, look for these ideas that we've had, and finally get them put into practice. Sometimes it just takes going out and doing the work, and that's my promise. All right. Thank you very much. OK, excellent. So already, the three of you have touched on a lot of the topics that we want to discuss tonight. So let's start to go a little bit more in depth. Um, question being, what solutions or suggestions would you offer for managing the skyrocketing numbers and costs of the out-of-district placements? And for this one, we're going to start off with Meg. Can you repeat that question? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry. Uh, what solutions or suggestions would you offer for managing the skyrocketing numbers and costs for out-of-district placements? Thank you. Um, so I think that this begins with what are we doing uh, for early childhood education and right up. So since I've um, been on the school committee and even when I ran early on, um, I've been really focused on what's happening at our elementary school level. Um, so I'm really pleased to see that our new leadership, our superintendent, is um, focused also on bringing in curriculum um, and professional development uh, at our elementary levels. Um, so what we're talking about right now is trying to actually build student skills so that they are not in need of additional special education services. Um, we certainly saw the boom after the pandemic um, of the need of those services. And we, as a district, um, which came out in our audit report uh, a couple weeks ago, is that we were not as staffed or as well equipped as we needed to be to service those students. Um, so I think the more that right now that we can invest, and that's not just dollar investment, it's investing in good practices um, at right early on um, will help to um, mitigate some of those costs of going out. Uh, I'm also excited that the district is looking at um, some in-district programming. So this morning, Dr. Geyser, our superintendent, was talking about um, identifying cohorts of students, particularly in the literacy area, um, language-based area, and creating programs in district for those students. Um, so these will take a few years to start to see some of those savings for sure. Um, but I think that those are some of the, the ways that we can begin to uh, mitigate some of these costs. And just to remember that um, also some of those costs were due to an increase at the state level in, in the tuition rate, which was a 14% tuition rate um, out of district. Um, so I think maintaining good, good relationships and having good conversations with our representatives uh, so that we are more aware when those are bubbling up and about to happen so we can plan for it. All right, thank you. Uh, next up, Angus. Well, I think uh, the state level issue that Meg touched on is important to stress. And you know, I'm I'm proud of my relationships uh, with staff on Beacon Hill uh, and the work that may be able to get done to uh, accrue more aid from the state on that matter. But what we can do in Belmont, the number one thing is pass the override and invest the money that is in that override in special education, in district, start building those programs and start seeing the cost savings in a couple years uh, so that when we look at the cost curves, we no longer see exponential growth. We see something manageable that can be a part of our budget and that we can work with. Uh, and that's going to take, in large part, early interventions. Uh, we, we've been talking about special education as an issue for over a year in Belmont. Uh, because we knew that this would be a major cost driver last year. We knew uh, what we were in for after the pandemic. And p a huge part of the reason the pandemic caused that spike was because it meant that our early interventions for students who were just beginning to fall behind were less accessible and less effective. But they've never been where they should be. And we have coasted by 
by allowing certain students to fall further and further behind through rough budget years, because that is sometimes the easiest thing to cut, because it doesn't come back to bite us immediately. But now it has. So we need to make those investments and return to the place where we have those services funded, and we will start seeing the benefits as less students have intense needs. Very good. Thank you. Matt. Right now, Belmont Public Schools spends $21.5 million a year towards our special education budget. That's 32% of the entire school budget. We have to find a way to serve kids well and make sure that we can do so in a sustainable way. And before we talk about how to do that, I just want to emphasize that while we talk about the dollars and cents, that kids are not just line items on a budget. These are about the sons and daughters of our residents. And we have to, by law and by, I think, our shared community values, provide those students with the most inclusive and highest quality education we can. I think there's general agreement that we have an opportunity to bring more students back into the district. And the challenge is going to be to implement that in a successful way. And that's going to take close attention to the data, because the savings come when you have consistent cohorts of students at certain age groups with certain needs, whether that be therapeutic or language-based or others, that make the concentrations of students in the, as they're paired with the teachers that we employ to serve them realized potential savings as compared to the out-of-district placement costs. I also think that we need to make sure that as a district, we explore all opportunities to partner with both the lab school and to make sure that as a system, we bring to bear the full spectrum of educational resources in our traditional general classes so that we present opportunities to catch challenges and support students before we have to provide full special education okay. services. OK, R rebuttal? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I would just like to um, briefly note that um, the district has been looking at this, so I don't think that the conversation just came up last year. Um, and there have been things that have been modeled and tried. So when the reconfiguration began, one of the big discussions was around creating more space for lab so that um, we would have spaces for our students in our schools, um, although lab is still out of district. Um, so as a board member, you are also very dependent on the leadership and their vision at that time. And uh, that was part of that leadership's vision. I think our new leadership has shifted some of that vision and has been looking at more of um, not just lab space, but you know, using the space for additional in-district um, placements. Uh, so I, I just want to put out there that I do feel like this has been a conversation. It's been something that the school committee has been very attuned to. Um, I think that we've been trying different models, and uh, we're seeing what's working and what's not. OK, very good. Thank you. Any other comments on that questions? No? All right. Let me follow along then on sort of curriculum questions. Um, we hear a lot in the media, and we've heard a lot of discussion at the school committee table about sort of two hot button issues, which is social emotional learning, a little bit of a tongue twister, and effective reading and math curricula. Um, just what are your thoughts? Where do you think the uh, system should be putting some emphasis? Um, what, what are your thoughts on how we tackle all of those issues, bearing in mind that funds might be a little limited? And for this one, we're starting with you, Angus. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the key here is that when we talk about social and emotional learning, we're talking about the ability of students to work together in a classroom setting, in their daily lives, and to learn effectively uh, and just participate in a world that is trying to teach them and also the world that they're going to go into after, after school. So. It's important to remember that opportunity for investment at the same time we're talking about those basic educational points of uh, reading, writing, mathematics. 
and making sure that we are facilitating both of those. Now, when we talk about curriculum investments, it is very important that we have the opportunity quite soon to get new curriculum for primarily math, uh, but across the board, we have major investments to make on the curriculum side. And I think focusing those on the areas where we have been not quite successful with keeping students up to speed. Uh, again, math, reading is a wise decision. But those also aren't operating expenses, right? Those are, for the most part, one-time expenses that are going to benefit us for a few years. We're going to have to make them again as curriculum and landscape changes. But we can definitely talk about certain curriculum investments as uh, one time, or at least not going to come back in the same capacity or more with inflation. And so what that allows us to do is talk about an environment where we have adequate math support, adequate writing support, and adequate social support, and then make our investments in those key curriculum areas. OK, thank you. Uh, Matt, how about your thoughts? Right now, we have an opportunity to invest in research-based and up-to-date curriculum. And I want to be clear, as a former classroom teacher, Curriculum is not just a textbook that sits in the corner of the room that you may choose to open. It's not that it's, we're getting a fancy book. It's, it, it is a guide that influences how you plan your lessons and you deliver your instruction. So it's bigger than just that piece of paper. And specifically, I think we have the opportunity to focus on early literacy curriculum. Right now, we have a collection of different curriculum materials, Hegarty and kindergarten and grade one. That's for more phonemic awareness. We have uh, foundations for phonics and units of study that is Lucy Calkins' work for reading and writing in grades K to four. And if you've read the Boston article, the Boston Globe articles, that's the curriculum, which is kind of the more controversial whole language curriculum. I, I think we have a real opportunity to align our practices across classrooms, which are understandably somewhat inconsistent because there's a whole range of resources and teachers take advantage of, of the different things available. We also have the opportunity to invest in stronger math curriculum. That might be something like Eureka Squared or Illustrative Math. And in addition to those things, support teachers with the professional development they need to implement that well. As a dad to a first and fourth grader, I certainly know that social emotional learning is key for them to build that self-confidence, to, to develop perseverance. And frankly, I know that may feel like soft skills and it's not foundational, but when you look at the research, it's those soft skills, those social emotional skills that are most predictive of students' success in college and in the workplace. And so that's not to say that we right. shouldn't if shore up math and reading. Yeah. All but right. we need to invest Good. in SEL. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Meg. Thanks. All right. I'll pick up uh, where Matt was. So on my way here, actually, I was listening to a podcast, and they were actually talking about students, uh, children's mental health and how during the pandemic, many of our young children were unable to get together and play. Mm -hmm. And so they were really talking about the benefit of free play, right? And, yeah. and how much we learn from playing. Doesn't everybody want to play and have fun? And so as a school committee member, you have some levers that you can move. Um, in order to really advocate for students. So one of the things that I've been really proud of this past year is we have um, engaged in a process of updating all of our school committee policies. The last time that happened was 2010. Um, so one of the things that really popped up was last year uh, when students were at the Chenery and parents felt like they were not getting recess and this was really impacting um, you know, their, their mental health, their social emotional learning. And so that is one of the policies that we have actually updated um, because that was not in our policy. So as a member of a board, it is very difficult to hold um, a district accountable for something when it's not even in your policy. Um, so that is one of the ways that we have started to look at that. Another way that we look um, to 
help students with their, really their social emotional learning and their mental health in our schools is through partnerships. So we have a wonderful partnership with the Belmont Wellness Coalition um, who are doing uh, things in our high school, oftentimes through grants. And we also have a new assistant superintendent who recently um, wrote and received a grant to help with students' mental health. So I think those are some really fantastic ways that we are helping with students, um, getting them that social emotional learning that they may need that um, may not actually cost any money to the district and um, I also would just say in terms of the the other pieces of the curriculum I think that it's curriculum it's professional development and it's a leader it's leadership who really creates the culture for that in the schools and um, I think right now we have a leader who is very focused on uh, like I said before the basics of the, the arithmetic the reading and the writing um, and so we're investing in that as well all right thank you very good all right let me shift focus a little bit um, we've built a giant new grade 7 through 12 school in order to ease enrollment pressure, only to see the enrollments at the elementary level going down. Here's the question, should we close the Burbank? And first person to answer is Matt. No pressure, Matt, by throwing you under the bus. No pressure. <laughs> this is a very serious question because we know from past history here in Belmont and across the country that closing a school is an extremely fraught and controversial thing because schools are sites of community gathering. I, when knocking on doors, I spoke to a number of different residents who were in a, their 40s, 50s, and said, oh, I went to Belmont, like I remember growing up there and that's such a meaningful place to me. And at the same time, the school committee is tasked with making difficult budget decisions when resources are scarce. My kids go to the Burbank. And so that is a personal question for me. I certainly don't want the school where my kids go to close, but I, view the responsibility of the position as one that we have to consider all options and weigh the costs and the benefits. And I think that what we cannot forget is that costs and benefits are not just dollars and cents. They are about shared history. They are about uh, values and community uh, cohesion and so I am very optimistic that we will come together to pass the override. And if that doesn't happen, then I am committed to looking at all 140 pages and every line item in the budget of our school district to find every opportunity to prevent that possibility. It's $900,000 in savings. I'm very confident that we can work to find a better solution for that. Okay, all right, thank you. Meg, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, my kids did not go to the Burbank. They actually went to the Butler. But um, multiple times a year, I do try to get out to schools as a school committee member and observe what's going on in the schools. And I have to say that a couple weeks ago, I was at the Burbank, and it was just such a tight-knit community there. Um, there was so much great engagement from the educators going on with the students. And even when you go into the modulars, which are still there, it's like such a, it's this little fourth grade, you know, um, cohort there that is is so close together. Um, so when this topic first came up at the school committee table, and we were actually directing the superintendent uh, to look at different options for making reductions, um, this was not one that I originally supported. But I do stand behind the school committee that that this moved forward for modeling because like Matt said, as a school committee member, you do have to make very um, difficult decisions. And um, I will remind everyone that the number that the schools were actually asked to reduce to uh, was a number that we never got to. Um, so we still had over a million dollars that we were being asked to model that we never got to. So although the, um, the Burbank is not a huge amount of money, um, there is the possibility that if the override doesn't pass in two years, the school committee will have to make some difficult decisions and that could be um, on the table. I think it's important to keep in mind um, that um, enrollment 
um, does ebb and flow. It, it has over time. And we, uh, because of that and hearing what the community's questions have been, we did engage with a population and enrollment um, consultant again. Uh, and we will be presenting that information in the, the next couple weeks at our school committee table. Um, so I think that this goes back to having to really gather all the data and all the information before making any hard decisions um, or any decision at all. It, it's really um, up to school committee members to make sure that we're asking for the data and the information that inform our decisions. Okay, thank you. Angus? Uh, well, I'll say my kids also didn't attend the Burbank because <laughs> uh, I don't have any. Uh, that might be kind of worrying. But <laughs> I think we have to look at every option that's on the table, and that is an option that's on the table. It's not a good option. I don't think there are any good options in the face of a no override vote. But it is also, as uh, Matt said, a small-ish option. Now, that's in the context of, again, a significant cut to the school budget where we will have to find, we'll call them efficiencies, but really it's, it's cuts. It's cuts to services in so many places. Now, closing the Burbank would be one very key example of why it's going to be so much more expensive to build back if this override fails than to maintain the level of service that we have. Uh, it costs more to open a school than it does to run a school. We, f we know that from building the high school. We know that quite clearly. And so it's important that we remember that when we look at a decision like closing the Burbank, because we know that those trends are going to change over time. We know that we may someday have significant growth in elementary enrollment. We probably will. Uh, frankly, and it may be, become important to have that entire classroom capacity of the Burbank and all of our other elementary schools, and we'll be stretched for space. So it'll cost a lot to build that back, and I, I don't like the idea of making cuts that are going to cost a lot to build back because I have faith that even if this override fails, we will find the new revenue opportunities. That said, it's an option. It's on the table. I hope I don't have to take that vote. All right, thank you. Can I add one more thing? Absolutely, I, certainly. I think Angus makes a really good point that if we charter the Burbank from its role as a institution for public education, reopening it will require us to make substantial updates to the plan and infrastructure to be ADA compliant. And so that would raise the bar. And so we, yes, there have been declines in enrollment during COVID and an uptick uh, recently, but we have to be able to prepare for uncertainties. And so that would take a lot off the table for what we don't yet fully understand as a community or frankly as a country about how public school enrollment is evolving in this new post-COVID era. Okay, all right. Um, uh, let me stick a little bit with that idea of, of funding and potential cuts uh, by asking, do you really save that much money by defunding things like sports, music, the arts, or busing? Um, I hear a lot in the community about scare tactics, and these particular proposed cuts are what leap to people's mind. Um, so. Comments, thoughts from you about the possibility of defunding those extracurricular things or busing and how much money you, you potentially actually save. And we will start with you, May. Thanks. So first of all, I understand this idea of scare tactics. And first of all, it's scary to even think about making any of um, these reductions to our schools. So. Um, the other piece of this is that the last time that we went out for an override, uh, there was a commitment to make reductions, and uh, that override did not pass. And at the same time, there was an influx of um, federal funds uh, coming out of, you know, not coming out of, we were in COVID, and there were many federal funds available. So I think that there is definitely some skepticism among people in the community, and rightfully so, that, um, you know, you said you were going to make reductions last time, but you didn't. Um, that is because we received those federal funds. We are not going to receive federal funds this time. Uh, there's also sometimes the question around um, we pay fees. So Belmont already has some of the highest fees in the state 
for our athletics, for our performing arts, um, for, for clubs and what have you. And, um, uh, oh, and I was going to, <laughs> sorry. And um, so how, you know, why is this even gonna save you any money? So I think it's important to remember that there are different types of funds funding sources in our budget. And so we do have revolving funds and that's where those fees go. And then we can use those fees potentially for things um, like new uniforms, right? Um, but we also have to pay all of these coaches that we have. And um, we have to pay the people who work with our students in the music and performing arts and these other uh, opportunities. And those come from our general fund. And that is the majority of um, the funds that do fund those programs. And um, those funds cannot always be mixed and revolving funds cannot always be used for anything other than what they've been targeted for. Um, and so there, there is a difference there that you have to understand and um, we, will, we would be able to um, reduce enough from the general fund that we would see some savings. And going back to our original um, uh, plan for making reductions, it was to make reductions as far from the classroom as possible. And that is why those were the first that we started pulling from. Okay, thank you. Uh, Angus, next up. Yeah, so as I said earlier, we do not have a school district that's funded per pupil at a very high level relative to the rest of the state. And what that means is that when we look to make reductions, we are really hollowing ourselves out to the most basic frame of what a school system looks like. And the most basic frame of what a school system looks like doesn't have you know, as many opportunities for performing arts, athletics, clubs. Uh, these are expensive things. They're not that expensive on the scale of 60, 70 million dollars, but they're a significant portion. And when we're asked to make reductions, you know, you have to look at everything. You really have to look at every single line in that budget, and it's the things that you can get by without for a year, a few years. But it's, it's not gonna be pretty, I'll say that. Uh, now, I think when we look at those reductions, we have to look at the impacts beyond just, oh no, we don't get to enjoy having a spring musical, right? I mean, I'm looking forward to going on Friday. Uh, but it's more than that. It's going to deeply impact the mental health of our students. Now, I've been in those classrooms. When you have a student who is struggling with mental health, that impacts the entire classroom. That makes it harder for the educator to do their job. It asks students to essentially grow up too quickly. Uh, you know, I, I had nights where I was on a phone call until 12.30 in the morning because I needed to be there for a friend, and that was when I was in Belmont High School. So when we talk about these cuts to extracurriculars, we have to be very aware of what we're doing. But they're a real option, and in the face of a no override vote, we're gonna have to look at every option. And the options that have been presented don't go far enough to meet our budget needs. Okay, thank you. Matt, how about you? I've heard this worry and concern from residents, knocking on doors, attending community events, are these cuts real? Uh, and I think this speaks to the critical importance of making sure the school committee is able to build on past efforts to communicate in a accessible and transparent way. And, and that means instead of having a budget that's online that you download and they're just individual line items that we have easy to access information graphics that just tell us clearly where is the money going and how does that compare to the previous year and how does that compare to our peer districts in the area so we can understand how we are doing and where we can improve and so that's how we think we get out of this cycle of do we have to ask for things and are they authentic? There's no way we're gonna move forward in a no override scenario without cuts. And they'll be meaningful, but I also think we need to be creative about recognizing there are two sides of balancing a budget. There's the opportunity to raise revenues and 
nothing is guaranteed, but I certainly think there are a lot of opportunities to pursue grants at the state and federal level, as well as private philanthropic grants, to take advantage of our amazing new facilities and spaces and classrooms that are unused and possibly rent those out. And even if we have to, to potentially raise fees, but also make sure that that doesn't make it, it, those extracurricular and sports inaccessible for families who cannot afford them. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna go off my own script here for a minute because a couple of you have mentioned more than once this idea of per pupil spending. And this is also a hot button for a lot of people in the community. Um, I didn't mention it. Huh? I said I didn't mention it. <laughs> That's right. Meg's off the hook. She did not mention She does not have to answer this question. No. Um, do we fully understand what goes into per pupil spending, number one? And number two, are we really that far behind? Because when you factor in what makes up per pupil spending, we, I would suggest, we should not be uh, comparing ourselves, say, to a Cambridge or a Waltham or some other communities that receive significant state and federal funding. So I'll just give you um, a little bit of time to answer, speak to per pupil spending. And the first person to answer is Angus. Yeah, so it's a number I've cited, which is why we're getting to this. Uh, and I think per pupil spending is a very useful initial benchmark to see where are we relative to the Commonwealth? Now, the thing is, we're not just slightly below 50% or lagging behind Cambridge and other similar districts. We are quite low on the scale for per pupil spending. And obviously, there's a lot that goes into that. When you look at our per pupil spending, including out of district placements, it goes up. Uh, but, you know, it's still not in a wonderfully advanced place. And that doesn't mean that we need to get to a wonderfully advanced place. It just means that when we want to have a conversation about where to find reductions in the overall town and school budget, even in the school budget, we should look at places where we are in comparison to other communities, right? And we're not just behind in the grand scheme of the Commonwealth against Boston, Cambridge, those, those districts. We're also behind when we look to districts that are really quite similar, Arlington, uh, Watertown. And you know that's because they've done the work on the revenue side. And Belmont has been resistant to doing the work on the revenue side. But it's really important that our school committee members take an active role in town affairs across the board, because the budget we're working with comes out of the town budget. The town budget, which is related to residential property taxes, commercial property taxes, payment in lieu of taxes from major nonprofits, all of these areas where we need to be advocating as a community and where the school committee should be advocating to make sure that our top line budget number can support our students. Okay, very good. Thank you. Matt, your thoughts on per pupil spending? The Belmont Public Schools spends about $16,500 per pupil. And if you add in some additional costs that are carried on the municipal side, like uh, some healthcare benefits and maintenance, that comes to a little bit over $18,000 per pupil. I know that sounds like a lot of money, uh, and it is, but at the same time, you have to compare what the rates of inflation have been in the last couple of years and, and what that money can actually buy in terms of materials and in terms of the uh, costs of our uh, FTEs, our 550 employees in the district. So I, I think two things are true. We can expand services if we increase the resources that we provide Belmont Public Schools, but we can also purposefully and continuously seek to make sure that we are using the money that we have wisely. And money itself has never been a solution in education. Money that's well spent is, but you can't even attempt to offer those services without that starting I will also say that we, I think, traditionally, historically, have been a town that does a lot with 
limited resources in education relative to our peers, and we should be proud of that, that, that we have been able to deliver uh, high quality education. But we haven't fully tapped the other non-financial resources, our parents, in our community, in our volunteers, as much as I think that we can. And so it's time for us to also invite them in and coordinate and take advantage of all the excellence and, and willingness to contribute that exists in our community. Okay, thank you. Meg, should you choose to answer? <laughs> <laughs> so as a school committee member, I'm always thinking about what levers I can use to actually improve um, our students' experiences in the classroom. And you know, the best thing is when you go in the classroom and um, there are students who are just really joyful in the classroom. I mean, um, and they are having fun with what they're learning. Not just learning to learn, but like they want to learn because they're having fun. Um, and so when I see that, there's, you know, there's great teaching going on then, right? We know that we, um, the majority of our budget is our educators um, and we invest in them. And um, the thing to me that keeps educators here and keeps our, our principals and our administration here um, are our leaders who are able to keep morale up, um, get our educators excited, get our educators joyful um, about their teaching and their job. Um, so when I think of per people spending, I, I actually think about um, what are we investing in to make sure that our students are having uh, a joyful uh, learning experience. And um, so to, um, to Matt's point, I, I am proud of what we've been able to offer our students and how we have used uh, the funding that we do have here in the district um, to provide those experiences to our students. Um, I, I, I'm sure we could always do more with more money. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure what that would result in at this point. Um, we haven't had that. And right now I just think that it's uh, really important for us to focus on what we do have and the best, what we can do the best with what we have. Um, and to Angus's point, it's always important to maintain your conversations, um, with your, officials at the state level and work very closely with the select board warrant committee and all of our town officials and I, I think we do that. Okay, very good, thank you. All right, now let me go for a really hot button question. Uh, given the long Newton teachers strike and the involvement of the Massachusetts Teachers Association, uh, I would ask have you been endorsed or supported by the teachers union? Uh, do you believe you would be able to negotiate in the best interest of the towns? And would you be willing to take a strike if the town does not have funding for large salary increases? So that's kind of a long convoluted question, um, but basically it's your relationship with the unions, your relationship for the best interests of the town, and if we faced a strike, would you be willing to take that strike to preserve the town? Uh, who gets to answer that first? Matt. Definitely a hot question issue, <laughs> but, but there's no doubt that we Lovely have to questions. confront that, knowing that w this election and kind of I think the upcoming year uh, has a shadow cast over it from the Newton teacher strike. And, you know, I, I think that we have to say as a school committee that we are working tirelessly on behalf of our students and our town to provide the best education that we can deliver. And teachers are an incredibly important part of that equation. And we frankly have been successful as a district by investing in our teachers and, and being pretty lean outside of that. So there's no doubt that we have to work to find a successful resolution to the upcoming collective bargaining agreement. But we cannot think that those investments are things that we can pull out of thin air or we can just sign on paper and say that we'll you know, change the compensation rate and, and, and then not have a plan about where that money's coming from and how that's gonna be 
impacting our budget two, three, four years down the line. And that type of financial modeling, that type of understanding the implications of how our 14 uh, steps and six lane or six or seven lanes on our pay scale will actually impact is what I do for my day job. And I'm excited to bring that to this process. I certainly would do everything in my power to avoid a strike, but if that's something that happens, I'm committed to standing firm to supporting our students and our community. Very good, thank you. Uh, Meg, thoughts? Yeah, so um, I have been through two uh, real negotiation processes. The first one was when I was elected in 2021, and we went into a one-year uh, MOA with our teachers union in order to get students back into school. Um, and so that was my first experience, which was kind of a brief one, um, late into the night. Uh, but we got you know our students back in, and I think that we really worked with the teachers union to make sure that those learning spaces were safe and um, that they were ready to go back in, given the different safety protocols that we had. And so I think a really important piece there is uh, trying to work together. So while the the as a school committee member, you come to the table with the best interests of the students, and the teachers union is there with the best interests of the teachers, um, and you try to find you know that common ground. Um, and I think that that's really important to enter into any negotiations with uh, that thinking. So then the next time that I went through this was uh, for the current contracts that we currently have. And there's one thing that um, I, I, I regret about that whole process, although I think that in the end, both the teachers union and the school committee would say that we came out of there um, in an agreeable place um, with those contracts. And that was that um, when I went in, the negotiations had already started. And uh, I remember the teachers union coming in at one point and saying to me, um, here are our values that we're going to negotiate by. Where are your values? And I looked at a current school committee member who had been there for a while, and um, I said, "What are our values?" <laughs> um, and and we we didn't have a plan. We we hadn't prepared there, you know. Um, and and I was kind of thrust into this. And so I think that that is really important moving forward. That the school committee sit down, they listen to the community, they they listen to the district and our leadership, and think about what are the needs of our students right now, um, so that we can go in with a really strong voice for our students. And, and hold on to that. It's really important when there are things that we feel that are going to benefit our students um, that a school committee uh, really advocate for those in the contract because um, once they're there, they're there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Angus. So I'll start by saying I'm proud to have the support of Belmont's educators in this race for school committee. And I think it's important to remember that the Belmont School Committee negotiates with two bodies in town, our educators but also the town, and when we talk to our educators, we're not talking about a budget top line. We're talking about how to use a budget top line. When we talk to the town, we are talking about what that number is. Uh, so I think when it comes to negotiating with a union, the most important thing is honesty. You know, we looked at, I think it was North Andover, it might have been regular Andover, uh, had a strike. Mm -hmm. In the fall. Had a contract. And now they don't have the budget top line to support that contract, and they're looking at layoffs. Right. And that would be tragic in Belmont. Negotiations with the teachers union don't determine the top line of our budget. They determine how that budget can be spent, what discretion the school committee has. And obviously, those are important areas. Uh, so I think the real thing that is most important is to, as we go through that negotiation process, be very clear about what a contract would mean for how many educators we can support, for what programs we can support, for what materials we can provide. I mean, the Belmont Educators Association does not want to see educators not having working whiteboard markers or educators uh, having class sizes that are too large, uh, educators that are being laid off, right? That's something that we all agree on. And the issue in contract negotiations is to work out a document that is going to get us to a place that we all want to be within a budget top line that is limiting. Okay, thank you. Interesting response to my question. Thank you. Now, any rebuttal or uh, further comment? I see some interest. Matt. Thank you. I think it's really important that the school committee, rather than negotiate with the town, is committed to collaborating with the select board and uh, the warrant committee to make sure that with the entire budget that we have, that we find a way to both serve our schools and 
invest in the municipal services that we have in town. That is a tough thing to navigate, and we have to do that collectively as a town. And if we're trying to support schools, we have to keep our eye on the prize, which is growing the size of that pie rather than fighting over it by investing in economic development. Okay, thank you. Meg, did you have a comment? Just a brief one. I, sure. It's interesting. Um, when I think about our teachers' contracts, I don't always go uh, directly to the, the money, the salary line item. Um, so uh, the contracts that we negotiate really uh, give the superintendent the ability to run the district and be the decision maker. And as a school committee member, um, that is who you hold accountable. So I don't hold the teachers union accountable. I, I, I can't, you know, call them up and um, ask them to do something differently. It's, it's really the superintendent. So I also think it's just really critical um, as we move forward and, and as you've seen in other districts um, to, as a school committee, maintain a contract that allows the superintendent um, the authority to really manage and run the district, um, albeit having a leader, a superintendent, who also is able to maintain a healthy relationship with all of our teachers and our union and, um, and work together. Okay. Uh, Angus, comment? Go I ahead. would like to quickly respond. Just when it comes to the difference between negotiation and collaboration, that line gets blurry all the time in town governments. You know, I've been on town meeting, I've been in situations where I'm negotiating in one breath, we go to a vote, uh, later that night I'm collaborating with the, someone who I was, you know, not just negotiating with, but completely on the other side of the aisle. And I think that's the best part of local government is that you can build some really weird looking coalitions. Uh, but, you know, the people we work with, we're always gonna have a blurred line between that negotiation and that collaboration. And I think it's important that we observe that blurred line when we're talking about the unions, when we're talking about the select board, when we're talking about the warrant committee, when we're talking about any of the other issues that our school faces. We go into that room to work out something. And sometimes we're gonna disagree on what that something is, and then it's a negotiation. But sometimes we're gonna agree on what it is, and then we're collaborating. Okay, thank you. Um, we're getting close to the end of our time, and so I cannot let any opportunity go by without talking about capital because I just love capital. So we are, however, going to just do one-minute responses to this question. So a large portion of capital money is spent on our school buildings. Um, what might be your capital priorities for our schools? How would we fund them? And then if you want to also address the operating expenses for our large new buildings. And for that, Meg, we start with you. I am excited that you asked that question <laughs> because we actually have made some changes um, at the school committee table in the last year. So we, um, we do have a facilities director uh, who uh, has been this year um, coming to the school committee table to update the school committee about the needs of our different buildings, um, his, his plans as he worked with our capital budget committee. Um, to keep us well informed, which um, I think is a big change. We are asked to take votes and support things at town meeting, and we haven't always had all of the information available to us. So I think this was a really important change that I wanted to make to make sure that, um, that we were informed so that we can advocate for um, really what the superintendent, the director of facilities, and our capital budget committee who work so hard um, to determine what the needs of our schools are so that the school committee can help to advocate for that. Um, but I really rely on them, especially because it's not in our budget. Okay, very good, good answer, thank you. Angus, how about you? Yeah, I think the number one capital issue, or at least pretty far up there, is the Chenery Boilers uh, and making sure that the town has enough money squared away to cover that expense when it comes up. Obviously, again, that's a town issue, and it's something I'm following closely mm -hmm. as a town meeting member. Um, and, you know, frankly, it does make sense for the school committee to be following that closely as well. Uh, I think the other big issue is deferred maintenance. We have, again, a habit in Belmont of not funding our maintenance appropriately, and then we realize, oh, shoot, we have a building that's falling apart, and we rebuild it. And that costs a heck of a lot of money. I mean, the new high school is a very expensive building. It's really exciting. It's a great facility. I got a year in it, and um, I enjoyed that year. Uh, but I think we really have to talk about maintenance and the operating costs of maintaining our buildings so that we don't have this level of debt exclusions, one after the other. OK. Matt, your thoughts on capital? I think this is a great example of about why it's so critical for the school committee and other uh, 
committees and the select board to really work closely and in partnership because the way in which our school buildings are kind of this shared resource that the town is responsible for maintaining but the schools occupy and, and take advantage of. Uh, school buildings are the working environments for teachers and learning conditions for students and, and investing in them is a wise investment. After we make that investment, we can't forget that the maintenance is the way in which we make sure that that original investment has the highest return because it lasts for the longest amount of time. And so let's plan for that to avoid these longer term challenges with um, you know, one time major capital outlays. Okay, very good, thank you. Well, we've had a really interesting discussion. I wish we could keep going. I still have some more questions on my paper. But we're running out of time, and so it's time for our closing statements. And happenstance, our rotation brings us back to the same order as the opening statements. So, um, Angus, I'll start with you. One minute. Well, thank you, Anne. Uh, a committee of six needs to be diverse in viewpoint, background, and experience. Now, I've been in some negotiations. I've worked with curriculums and budgets, probably more than anyone at this table had when they were 19. Uh, but still a very significant uh, part of the work I've done. And I know the jargon and the procedural tools that it takes to put that perspective and values that I'll bring to the school committee table into language that our district can act on. So when you go to the polls on April 2nd, I just ask you to think about what will be missing if each candidate isn't elected. Is it gonna be a financial background or an education administration background or is it that grounded perspective in our classrooms and the modern challenges we're facing? You get two votes. Uh, so I hope you'll use them to build a committee that is more diverse, that gives everyone a seat at the table. I look forward to meeting you in town at events or on the doors, and you can always reach out with questions or concerns. I humbly ask for one of your two votes on April 2nd. Okay, thank you so much. Matt, your wrap up. I wanna start out by just uh, thanking my fellow candidates. Serving on the school committee is a volunteer position. And it's a considerable investment of time, as the current school committee members certainly know, and the many past school committee members that I've spoken with have made sure that I'm very well aware of. And one of the reasons I'm running is because I think that this is a pivotal moment for Belmont schools as we move forward under new district leadership. We need a school committee that is willing to take a proactive role to developing and delivering on an ambitious and sustainable vision for our schools. I am deeply committed to Belmont schools and I see their potential to be a leading example of educational excellence for all. My 20 plus years studying K-12 education policy and working with public schools gives me the perspective and experience to know what is possible and how to achieve it. I ask for one of your two votes on April 2nd. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Thanks, so according to the rubric that I gave you at the beginning, um, I believe that I fit the criteria for your vote on April 2nd. I'm a parent. I entrust my children's safety, academic growth, and well-being to our schools every day. I'm an educational professional. I'm an experienced member of the school committee who understands the role in governing. When I was elected in April 2021, I then served as chair for two years, and I truly believe in teamwork is critical to getting things done. I've worked with my fellow school committee members, town officials, and state officials to accomplish many things, including getting kids back to school in 2021 in a safe learning spaces, successfully negotiating union contracts, securing one-time money, hiring and onboarding a new superintendent, conducting substantial updates to our school committee policies and uplifting student voices by having students at all of our school committee meetings. I'm also a taxpayer and a volunteer in Belmont. Um, I'm excited to continue serving our community and making our fantastic schools even better. And ultimately, I just want every student to want to be a student at Belmont Public Schools. Thank you, all three of you, for being here with me today and for your very interesting responses to my questions. This has been the Belmont School Committee candidate debate. I'm Anne Marie Mahoney, urging you to get out and vote on April 2nd. You have two votes for school committee. Thank you.